Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Dana Clark. I'm a hip and knee arthroplasty specialist with OCR. Um, I'm always curious. I'm, uh, I want to show of hands. Um, how many uh, MDs or DOs are in the audience right now? PAs. NPs. Nurses. Surgical techs. X-ray techs. Yay! Chiropractors. All right. I, am I leaving anybody out? Oh my God, PT! Uh, you guys don't matter anyway. Yeah. All right. Any taxidermists? I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning. Um, OT, my God. All right. Speech language pathologist? Okay. All right. So, um, for all the circulating nurses and all the texts, I want you guys to listen intently this morning because this is a really, really important topic. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on prosthetic joint infection, okay? That is infection of a hip or knee arthroplasty. And it can, it can affect any joint, but we're just going to be talking about hips and knees, and I think this little thing is doing something funny. Okay. So my goals this morning are for you guys to understand what the scope of the problem is that we're dealing with, to discuss how people get infected, what's the pathogenesis, to discuss how these people present, to discuss what bacteria and fungi and everything cause these infections, to discuss how we diagnose this, and then ultimately how do we treat it, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of these varying different options. So, what's the scope of the problem? About 2.5 million hip and knee arthroplasties are performed every year. One to two percent of those people are going to get a PJI or an infection. It costs our healthcare system about a 1.5 million, 1.5 billion dollars a year to deal with this problem, and I think that's probably low. Uh, and as a provider, I cannot even begin to communicate to you guys how big of a deal this is to the patients, to the families how much time off of work, how much pain, and all these things. It is a devastating disease. The other thing I want you guys to realize is that prosthetic joint infection is deadly. Look at this chart over here on the left. Here's the people that got infected. Here's the people that didn't. 90 days, 3.7 versus 0.8. One year, 10.6 versus 2, so on and so forth. This kills people. Look over here. here. Here we got cancer, all right? It's more deadly than prostate cancer, melanoma, breast cancer. The only thing that's worse is colon and lung. So big, big deal. All right, what's the pathogenesis of PGI? This problem occurs when bacteria seed the joint space. And this can occur one of three ways. It can occur intraoperatively with inoculation, so poor sterile technique. Uh, super important is airborne pathogens, and this is really a function of too many people in the room. And the people that operate with me, you guys know I hate it when we have too many people in the room, people coming in and out, and this is why. Because bacteria enter the air, it gets into the wound, it causes infection. So take that seriously, please. Uh, early postoperative is probably the leading cause. Um, skin flora enter the wound via wound drainage, and I'll communicate this more and more, that wound drainage is probably the biggest cause of prosthetic joint infection, and it needs to be taken very seriously. Lastly is a late postoperative infection. This is going to occur hematogenously. For instance, you get a sinus infection, the bacteria enter the bloodstream, blood flows past the artificial knee, boom. Um, risk factors, as I talked about earlier, number one, wound drainage, big deal. Um, more often than not, this occurs with anticoagulants, and not all anticoagulants are created equal. Lovenox, in particular, is the devil. It makes wounds drain, and it, it is awful, but any anticoagulant can cause this. And then the typicals, Obesity, diabetes, smoking, alcohol abuse, malnutrition, all these are risk factors. These last two here, I would argue if somebody's on dialysis, they shouldn't get a joint replacement. Their infection risk is almost 
you have cirrhosis, I'm sorry, I'm not replacing your hip or knee, you're gonna get infected. So, how do these people present? Um, we're gonna talk about two different scenarios. Um, one, a monkey can diagnose, and the other one, you need to be Sherlock Holmes. Uh, the monkey diagnosis is the fulminant infection. Uh, this is blatantly obvious, okay? Um, it can occur early or it can occur late. Um, but what these people present like is severe pain. They're febrile. Their hip or knee is crazy red, swollen. They're draining pus. Oftentimes, they're septic. They have bacteremia. Their blood pressure's low. Their heart rate's high. This is a surgical emergency. This is not hard to diagnose, okay? Um, and then in addition to that, their labs are grossly abnormal. Their white blood cell count is super high. Their CRP is super high. So that is fulminant infection. This last one is more complicated, and this is, quite honestly, the more common presentation. This is an insidious infection, uh, far less obvious. It tends to occur more late onset, so months to years down the road. Uh, what these patients present like is moderate to low-grade pain. Uh, when you ask them, did you have a lot of drainage after your surgery? Oftentimes, yes, some, but not always. Uh, these people will not have systemic signs of sepsis. They're not sick, they're not febrile. Um, they may or may not have an effusion or swelling. Uh, when you examine them, they might have some mild joint irritability. Um, X-rays can be normal, they can also be abnormal. Uh, this picture here is a picture of a loose femoral component. Uh, there's a clear line between the stem and the bone. That could be indicative of infection. And then finally, the C-reactive protein tends to be only mildly elevated. So, um, let's talk about how we work these people up. Um, we look at a number of things, labs, synovial fluid, and then lastly, tissue, which would be in the OR. Let's talk first about labs. CRP and SED rate are the gold standard screening test. Okay, now come over here. This is the MSIS, or the Musculoskeletal Infection Society criteria of 2020. It's important to distinguish where this patient is in relationship to surgery. So acute, they had surgery less than 90 days ago. Chronic, greater than 90. So a set rate in the acute setting is not helpful. It tends to be super, super high for a really long period of time, we don't even look at it. CRP is gonna be greater than 100 if they're in the acute setting, okay? Now, in the chronic setting, different story. SED rate has value, it would be greater than 30. And in a chronic setting, CRP greater than 10. So markedly different. Um, I get these patients all the time. They go to the ED, they got a red hot swollen knee, their CRP is 89, and oh, by the way, they're two weeks out. Well, that's normal. So, moving on to the, uh, oh, the other thing I wanna tell you is particularly in the chronic setting, if you're working up a patient for a potential infection and both their SED rate and CRP are, is negative, there's a 98% chance they're not infected. It is an excellent screening test. It is very sensitive, unfortunately not specific. The CRP and SED rate can be up with the flu or a sinus infection or anything else. Now let's move on to synovial fluid. We look at a number of different things. Uh, the first of which is the white blood cell count. Uh, the second is uh, percentage of neutrophils per milliliter. And those are really kind of the workhorses. So just like with CRP and SED rate, we also know that those values are gonna differ acutely versus chronically. In an acute setting, the white count's gotta be pretty high, greater than 10,000. In a chronic, only greater than three. And then the percentage of neutrophils acute is going to be greater than 90. And then in the chronic, greater than 80. Uh, these other uh, data points are relatively new. Uh, this is alpha defensin, leukocyte esterase, and CRP. And I would say in the last 5 to 10 years, we've been testing for that in the synovial fluid. And particularly, the alpha defensin and the leukocyte esterase have been really, really helpful in terms of trying to reach a diagnosis. And then lastly is tissue pathology. Um, this is an intraoperative finding. 
Uh, we take a biopsy, we send it to the pathologist, they put it under a high-powered field, and if they see five or more neutrophils um, in that high-powered field, that's considered a positive test. Okay, so how do we actually say someone is infected or they're not? So I want to talk a little bit about this MSIS. So the Musculoskeletal Infection Society is a group of 400 delegates, 50 countries. They meet yearly. It's been really, really good. Uh, it's a diverse group consisting of hip and knee arthroplasty orthopedic specialists, uh, infectious disease specialists, and epidemiologists. And they've given us this criteria to say whether or not a patient is infected. So. There are major criteria, and then there are minor criteria. A single positive major criteria, they're infected. So what's positive there? Well, two positive cultures of the same organism, that's major, you're infected, you're done. You can stop your workup. A fistula tract or a sinus tract that communicates with the joint space, that's a major criteria, you're done, they're infected. Those are less common. More often or not, we're kind of dealing in this situation. So, um, Jeff, you're killing me. <laughs> All right, so um, minor criteria. We're looking at CRP or D-dimer, SED rate, and then down here, synovial fluid. So, if you got an elevated CRP or D-dimer, you get two. SED rate, you get one. Elevated synovial white cell count or leukocyte esterase, three. Alpha defensin, three. Um, percentage of polymorphs, two. CR, uh, synovial CRP, one. With these, you add them all up. Greater than six, infected. Two to five, indeterminate. Zero to one, not infected. If you happen to fall into this area right here, possibly infected, and you take them to the operating room, then there are more data points that you can look at as well. If a patient has positive histology, that's that greater than five neutrophils, that's three. If there's pus in the joint, that's three. If you get a single positive culture, it's two. Once again, greater than six infected, four to five inconclusive, less than three not infected. So that is how we diagnose prosthetic joint infection, okay? All right, looking at the microorganisms that cause infection, um, not surprising. Staph species comprise the vast majority, and there's about an equal split between Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. Staph aureus, fulminant infection, sick, obvious. Staph epidermidis, more indolent. That's where you need to be the Sherlock Holmes to kind of find those answers. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that there's a really high rate of culture-negative infections. So sometimes we can't ever get anything to grow. They just happen to reach those criteria on the MSIS, and then also a fair amount of polymicrobial, particularly in the early. All right, moving on to treatment. Um, the big thing I want you guys to know is that treatment is always surgical. Antibiotics don't work. Every single person with a prosthetic joint infection needs surgery. These are the treatment options down here. Um, I'm not even going to mention arthrodesis or fusion or amputation. Um, very rarely do we have to go there, uh, and it's a little bit archaic. So um, we'll move on to the first one here called DARE. So DARE stands for debridement, antibiotics, and implant retention. So what this consists of is an aggressive soft tissue debridement Removal of modular parts. So what's a modular part? That'd be the plastic in this knee right here. I can pop that out, get to the back of the knee so I can debride it posterior, uh, and then we would copiously irrigate, debride again, and then put new plastic back in, close them up, and then they get treated with six weeks of intravenous antibiotics. And more often than not, these patients are then treated with lifelong chronic oral antibiotic suppression uh, which can increase the success rates. So when is DARE indicated? First of all, it's not well defined, and you'll see a lot of these surgical treatments, they're just simply not defined, there's not great data, but in general, most of us feel that it's gotta be a pretty short duration of infection, less than four weeks. Uh, the host has to be healthy, okay? 
They can't be somebody who's immunocompromised. That's going to fail. You have to know what the organism is, and you also have to know what antibiotic is going to kill that bug. You need to know the sensitivity. And then lastly, the components need to be well fixed. If the components are loose, um, it makes no sense to leave them loose. You should revise those components. So what are the contraindications? Chronic infection, polymicrobial infection, and then finally fungal organisms uh, aren't going to respond well to it there. Uh, success rates, really variable, 30 to 90 percent in the literature, improved with chronic oral suppression. Realistically, it probably works about half the time, uh, particularly when you add on chronic oral antibiotics. Next treatment option is uh, what's called a single stage revision. Um, I'm a big fan of this when I can do it. Um, it's gaining a lot of favor in the U.S. Uh, was widely utilized in Europe for the last 30 to 40 years, and they've had really, really good success rates. So uh, what this means is we are going to aggressively debride the wound. We're going to take out the previously uh, placed components, copiously irrigate, and then go back in right away with these revision components. Oftentimes, we'll then place antibiotic beads, so it's some sort of salt that you impregnate with vancomycin and all these different antibiotics, and that leaches out really high concentrations of antibiotics directly into the wound. These people will then be treated with six weeks of IV antibiotics, and then oftentimes, once again, chronic oral suppression is going to increase the success rates here. So when is it indicated? Once again, not well defined, but once again, you got to know the bug and you have to know the sensitivity. The host, host has to be healthy and importantly here, they can't be septic. If somebody's bacteremic uh, and they're septic, this is not an appropriate procedure. That's an indication that really they should undergo a, a two-stage revision, which we'll get into here in a second. Uh, contraindications include an immunocompromised host. You don't know the bug. It's a fungus. You've got a se severe soft, soft tissue defect that needs a flap, or the patient has an extensive sinus tract. Success rates are pretty variable in the literature, 20 to 95 percent, likely successful about 85 percent of the time. Uh, once again, this has been the norm in Europe for a long time, uh, with their success being arguably just as good as our two-stage success. At present, there is a large multi-institution randomized control trial that's going on right now comparing single versus two-stage revisions, and I think we're all really looking forward to that data. So the last treatment option is what's considered the gold standard. It's a two-stage revision. So what this consists of is, once again, aggressive soft tissue debridement, removal of the components, but then we're going to put in this temporary guy here. And what this is, is for the femur, um, you've got antibiotic rods up the femur, down the tibia, lots of bone cement, and this is what's called an articulating spacer. So the patient can bend the knee, they can weight bear. It tends not to be the best knee in the world, but at least they can get around. That's left in place while the patient undergoes IV therapy. Um, and then somewhere around 12 weeks later, you go back and you put this revision component in. So indications for a two-stage, it's indicated for any infection. No one's going to argue with you. It can be any, any, any type, any patient. Uh, but definitive indications, um, sepsis, like we talked about earlier, compromised host, a polymicrobial infection, a fungal infection, or severe soft tissue compromise with a fistula tract. All right, what are the success rates? Um, once again, widely variable, 50 to 90 percent in the literature, probably about 85 percent uh, long run. Uh, but what we have figured out by Mark Coventry here is that if these patients do undergo a prolonged course of oral bionics postoperatively, uh, it definitely leads to improved eradication rates. Okay, so what are the advantages of a single stage versus a two stage? There's the obvious one, it's one surgery. 
Um, but that's important because that one surgery leads to decreased morbidity, all right? Um, patients get their range of motion back. They move on with their lives more quickly. There's less time off work, all those things. But the big thing that really drove me to doing a single stage, this one. 10% more people die when they get a two-stage for reasons we don't completely understand. But oftentimes, these people that get infected are old, they're sick, and every time you put them under, there's a risk they're going to die. So if you can do one surgery and be successful with it, probably should do that. Um, obviously, decreased cost, one surgery. But the other thing that's really important from a surgical perspective, going in to remove that spacer is a nightmare. Oftentimes, these people are so stiff, it's hard to get exposure, the skin is crap, and it's just a really hard surgery, and it's hard for, hard for it to go well. So, conclusions. Um, there's no clear-cut answer as to what is best. A dare is only indicated for short-term infection, known organism, healthy host. A single stage is gaining popularity, has similar eradication rates, and there's less morbidity and mortality. Two-stage still has its place when you have systemic infection, you're a poor host, or polymicrobial or fungal disease. All right, let's run through some uh, case scenarios here. And yes, this is driving me crazy. All right, first patient is my new knee hurts. Um, it's a 71-year-old male. He's four weeks out from a left knee. Uh, it's got an aortic valve replacement, so um, has to go back on Coumadin. So he underwent this Lovenox bridge. And while he was on Lovenox, his wound drained a lot. Shows up to the ED with a red hot swollen knee. His temperature is 100.8. As you can see, it's red. White count's not bad, 9.8. CRP is 112. Show of hands. What should we do? Number one, prescribe an antibiotic. Good. Number two, get an ultrasound to rule out a DVT. Good. Aspirate the knee joint. Everybody should be raising their hands right now. You should aspirate the knee joint, okay? Um, because believe it or not, that patient might not be infected. They could just be really hot and swollen. Uh, but you have, to, you, have to get a, you have to get a bug, so you gotta drop fluid off. Um, you know, taking two aspirin, call me in the morning is always an option as well. Okay, so my new knee hurts, aspirate, shows 75,000 whites, 95% PMNs, there's gram positive cocci in the gram stain, x rays are normal. That's infected, by the way. So, all of the following are reasonable treatment options except. Adair, just give them antibiotics. Is that an option? No, good. Dare, single stage, two stage, all those are on the table. So surgical issue, like we talked about, surgery. My next patient is new hip, not so good. Uh, this is an 82-year-old female. Uh, healthy, minimal medical problems, two years out from the left total hip. Initially did well, comes in to see me, complaining of about three months of increased pain. She's afebrile, she doesn't have any systemic signs. Exam, she's got a little bit of irritability when I move her around, but not bad. X-rays are normal. So, I sent her to PT, told her to take some Celebrex. Unfortunately, she came back a couple months later, getting worse. So, I lab her up, CRP's 27. That's above normal. Sed rate's up. So then I take her to the OR for an aspiration. And white counts elevated at 5,500. PMN's 92%. Positive alpha defensin. And she's growing out staph epi. So what are our treatment options? What would be reasonable out of these four? Who likes oral antibiotics? How about a dare? You like a dare, OK? How about a psych consult? Helps everything, right? All right. So this would be one where a single or a two-stage revision 
would be indicated. The DARE is not indicated, it's chronic. Like we talked about before, oral antibiotics are, are never an option. Psych consult's always great, though. Okay, last one, last patient, knee hurt, feel like sheet. This is a 67-year-old female with type 2 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, is on chronic steroids, takes Humira, comes in with pus draining out of her knee. Temperature's 103.4, she's hypotensive, and she's got positive blood cultures uh, for Staph aureus. You aspirate the knee, getting back 110,000 whites, 98% PMN, Staph aureus. X-rays here, the implants are loose. What treatment option is best for this patient? Who likes a dare? How about an appendectomy? Yeah. Uh, single stage revision, anybody want to do that in this one? No. Two stage revision, right? So this patient's immunocompromised, they're septic, their components are loose. This is a clear cut indication for a two stage revision. Thank you guys. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes? I sure can. So the question is, can I speak to uh, dental prophylaxis? So um, it used to be the standard that we would ask our patients to take two grams of amoxicillin prior to getting their teeth cleaned or undergoing some sort of dental procedure. Um, that has been debunked, all right? At our last um, hip and knee meeting, um, great study out of England where they basically showed with impunity that it is, makes no difference. It's a practice that we should not do. So in my opinion, no. You're, you're gonna have your hangers on that still do it, but it is not clinically indicated. Anybody else? Thank you guys.